Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 13. We'll be reading the first seven verses of Romans 13. Follow along in your Bibles. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's pray together. God, we come to this, your word, and we ask for your help. We are creatures in need of you. We need your assistance to understand your word, and we need your assistance to believe your word, and we need your assistance to heed your word, to do what you would have for us to do, to be pleasing in your sight. Lord, that is what we want. We need your Holy Spirit indwelling us, the truth of God to capture our minds, our thoughts, our affections, and God, we want our wills to be enslaved to that which brings you glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. To do what is simple is not always easy. If you want to stand on the top of the world, for instance, you have to climb Mount Everest. The concept of standing on the top of the world is simple. The task of getting there is something else altogether. What we have in our text this morning are two very simple commands. And while these commands are simple, that is, they are easy to understand, they're not complicated, they are difficult. And they are difficult for us because they involve our submission to flawed authority. We're looking this morning at Romans 13, 5 through 7, and we can summarize these three verses as they complete our section on the Christian and government, these three verses can be summarized with two very simple instructions. And we can sum them up in really two words. Submit and support. The Christians are obligated by this text to submit to governing authorities and to support governing authorities. Those are the very two simple commands we're looking at this morning. And we're going to need help to heed those, to put ourselves under them, and to obey them in a way that honors God. If you remember from the last three weeks, we've been looking at the theology that undergirds our submission. And as we come to our text this morning, we get to see some motivations that really help drive our wills in this area. Uh, A motivation horizontally towards man, and a motivation vertically towards God. And then we'll see what the result of those motivations are as we look to support human government. What does it mean to truly be supportive of human governments? Let's look at that first command, the first of these two simple instructions for Christian under under human government is submit to governing authorities. And this is verse 5, and verse 5 in Romans 13 serves as a summary of what Paul has described for us in the first four verses. He says, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. It is necessary to be in subjection. That is a way to give a command again, and a summary command of all that he said before. And he gives us two motivations in this section. The theology that undergirded Christian submission to government gave us the right ways to think. And I think here in verse 5, Paul gives us two critical motivations to really drive our wills that we might be submission to human government. That horizontal motivation towards men and the vertical motivation towards God, 
Notice the first, which is that horizontal one. It's necessary to be in subjection, verse 5, not only because of wrath. Not only because of wrath. And the wrath here is the wrath of the state. It's what he's been talking about. The state or the government does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God for good to us. And so because the state has a sword and bears wrath against evildoers, that is a motivation for us to do well. Those consequences motivate us. That does not bear the sword in vain. There are times when godly men and women in history have disobeyed human government. And very often they have endured the consequences for that disobedience. So even when our disobedience is right before God, the state bears the sword not in vain. And that's going to encourage us to select our disobediences very carefully. Right? When it comes down to an Acts 5.29 issue, when it is clearly an issue of we must obey God rather than men. And what's embedded in this motivation is not simply the desire to avoid getting caught and punished. Right? The state has the power to repress bad behavior. I've had my picture taken at a red light camera. But importantly, beyond getting caught or, or paying some fine, having some consequence, is the reputation of the church that is on the line in this. You see, Christians are not to be known as lawless. It goes beyond what can be prosecuted. Uh, what can the state do to me? What will the police do? Who will find out? This goes to the very heart of the Christian whose loyalties are to Christ. And you see the consequences of Christian rancor, uh, that is a, a defiance, a railing against governing authorities, is that the gospel itself gets tarnished before men at a horizontal level. And not only is the gospel tarnished, but our proclaimed loyalties get confused. Am I a citizen of heaven, first and foremost? Or, I st or am I staking my claim on this earth in a temporal way, demanding my rights for this fleeting life I live on this earth? And when we do that, our message gets blurred. We begin to live for the here and now, rather than to cast all of our eggs into the basket of eternity, to double down on the bet that eternity is better and that it is all worth it and that there are rewards in heaven for faithfulness here. You and I have a hope that transcends time, transcends the borders of this nation, transcends this earth. It's interesting, in Acts 17, Paul and Silas and a group of other believers were thought to be lawbreakers. They were thought to be lawless. Or at least that supposed reputation was maliciously used against them before the governing authorities. Listen to Acts 17, verses 6 and 7. When the group did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And notice what's at stake here. The, the Christians, of course, only worship God. They only worship the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are worshipers of Jesus. There, it's true, there is another king. And yet the Christians were loyal to Caesar under Jesus' direction. They paid to Caesar what was Caesar's. They followed the laws until the laws demanded they worship Jesus. But even this reputation of upsetting the world gave food, gave fuel to the, those who are opposed to Christianity, those who are opposed to Christ. And so this reputation as being contrary to the decrees of Caesar became attached to Paul and Silas. Now, given enough time, that would prove to not be true. That was the, the lie, the malicious slander of an angry mob. However, it points to something that's really important for us. If Paul and Silas and the other believers hadn't paid their taxes, or if they had run all the red lights, then these charges would have stuck. And they wouldn't have suffered for the gospel. Paul would not have been able to say, I am in defense of the resurrection. That's why I'm being charged today. No, his accusers could say, no, he ran all the red lights, he didn't pay his taxes. 
one of the consequences of Christian disobedience to government is a reputation for lawlessness. And then the very thing we say we're living for gets confused before a watching world. And one of the consequences of Christian obedience to the state becomes a living apologetic for the gospel, a clean conscience before the governing authorities, a good reputation before a watching world, actually becomes a platform for the very message we preach. I've been forgiven of my sins before God. I worship God and God only, but God tells me to submit to the kings, so I do gladly and with gratitude. We pray for kings. We pay our taxes. We are eager to be beneficial to the people of this world, but it is because we have a love for Christ and my home is in heaven. That becomes a, a remarkable apologetic for the gospel. In fact, Christians ought to be the best citizens. They ought to be known for being the best citizens in the realm. Christians ought to be known as being the best obeyers. Again, John defines for us sin as lawlessness. If Christians wear a brand that says, I am lawless, I am defiant, I am rebellious. This goes against the very thing that Jesus came to save us from. To help us today, I want to give some extended examples this morning from church history that I think will help us recognize that we're not alone. In the day when coronavirus has run its course, when the government restrictions on us now are eased up, we need to understand that more restrictions are coming. If we live long enough in human history, uh, we will suffer under far severer things than we have experienced in the last couple of months. And you and I need to be ready for these things. We need to steal our convictions around the Word of God. We need to strengthen our faith in God's safety, His care for us, His love for us. And we need to strengthen our resolve to sit under what He has told us to sit under and to trust Him. So to that end, I want to bring forward a few examples this morning from church history. One comes from Justin Martyr. Uh, martyr is probably a familiar word to you. It's the definition of someone who dies for the faith. Uh, the word martyr simply means testimony, someone who gives testimony to something, a witness. Uh, Justin Martyr was a man in the 2nd century, the 3rd century, excuse me, who wrote a letter to Emperor Antonius Pius. And he was writing to appeal to the emperor of the Roman Empire that Christians not be unjustly prosecuted and put to death. He, he said to the emperor, we're not looking to overthrow your kingdom. In fact, we want to be the best citizens you have. He said, more than all other men, we are your helpers and allies in promoting peace. Seeing that we hold this view that it is impossible for the wicked, the covetous, the conspirator, and for the virtuous to escape the notice of God, and that each man goes to everlasting punishment for salvation. Do you hear what he's saying? If the Bible regulates the lives of Christians, we will be your best citizens. We will love our fellow man. We will promote the peace. We will not be those who conspire against the king. John Calvin in the 1500s wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion. That is what we commonly know as his theology textbook. It is a remarkably devotional book, but it had a personal purpose in its very first rendition. In a preface to the Institutes, he wrote his letter to King Francis I, the King of France, August 1st, 1536. And his appeal to the King of France, who uh, was head of the government that was persecuting Christians. At the time, France was tied to the medieval Catholic Church that was violently opposed to the Reformation doctrine. Uh, you remember that 1536 is just a couple of decades after Martin Luther put his 95 Theses to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg. So the Reformation was really just emerging, and the Church, combined with the state, was opposed to Reformation doctrines. And Calvin's appeal to the king of France was to one who considered himself a Christian king. And he said, if you're a Christian king, then you must love the scriptures. And I want you to know that Reformation doctrine in the 1500s is not new. The Institutes of Calvin set out to prove that 
The doctrine of the Reformation was, in fact, very old. It was the doctrine of the Old Testament. It was the doctrine of the New Testament. It was the doctrine taught by the apostles. It was the doctrine held by the early church. The Reformation was, in fact, a rediscovery of very old truth. So, please don't persecute us. This is not subversive doctrine designed to undermine your rule, King Francis. You, Calvin said, are a minister of God to do God's work. And we as Christians seek to honor you. Calvin ends this letter with a simple prayer. May the Lord, the King of Kings, establish your throne in righteousness and your dominion in equity, most illustrious King. And Calvin's heartbeat was to defend the truth, to plea for the cessation of persecution of Christians, but to do so under the authority of the King of France. In the last month, we've seen in the headlines a number of churches who have openly defied governing authorities. Some churches even who have boasted in their defiance. And such churches incur the wrath of the state, and, and in many cases, not for behavior that God demands, but simply out of a spirit of defiance. And this is certainly contrary to the demeanor that God requires of Christians. It does not adorn the gospel of God our Savior with good behavior. To defy government out of so-called faithfulness to God, out of a desire to uphold the truths of the Bible, would require that we remember Titus 3.1, which is in the Bible and is one of the doctrines of God. Titus there tells believers, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. That is God's expectation for believers. You can't defy the government to defend Titus 3.1 and be keeping Titus 3.1. When we do have to pull out our Acts 5.29 card, when we do actually have to say, I must obey God rather than men, the king is demanding that I do something that God forbids. Or the king is preventing me from doing something that God expressly commands. When we have to do that, then let it be from a reputation of submission, a reputation of good works, a reputation of being peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration to all men. Let it be from a reputation of good citizenship and tax paying and honor given to those in authority. We obey laws, we pay taxes, we honor authorities, not just to avoid undesirable circumstances. We do not consider ourselves subject to human government only for man's sake. But notice here in Romans 13, 5, for God's sake. Notice how Paul puts this. Also, for the sake of conscience. And I believe what Paul has in mind here is our conscience before God. That is that internal mechanism God has given us for the understanding of what is right and wrong before Him. And every human being has a conscience. Consciences can be trained to think wrong things are right and right things are wrong. But the Christian conscience, retrained under the Word of God, has categories of right and wrong that fit and align with God's own categories. And so Christians are to honor and submit to the government not only at the horizontal level for man's sake, not only for consequences and the reputation of the church, but also for God's sake, for conscience' sake. Listen to Acts 23.1. Paul speaks of the conscience this way. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. In Acts 24.16, he said, In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. Paul's conscience was important. And the Christian conscience is important because it means our behavior is relegated by a standard outside of ourselves. And that is the standard of God's expectations. Solomon in the institution of government, as king, gave this encouragement, Ecclesiastes 8.2. He said, keep the command of the king because of the oath of God. 
Now, it might sound self-serving for a king to say, keep the command of the king. But what's interesting about Solomon's command there is he says, not keep the command of the king because I said so. But he says, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. That is, because of your loyalty to God, because of your desire to obey him. And Peter echoes the same thing. Peter wasn't a king. He sat under kings, even unjust kings. And he said in 1 Peter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. You and I do that for the Lord's sake, says Peter. To reject God's rule in my life, that rule mediated through earthly human authority, is to sin. God has required our subjection to earthly authority, and so we gladly submit to it, for His sake, for His glory, in obedience to our King. When a young kid is given some direction by someone who's not his dad, and the kid looks to his dad, wondering whether it's okay to follow these directions, and the dad looks back at the son, nods his head, and says, It's all right, son, you can do what he said. As Christians, you and I love God, and we want to please Him, and and so we look to Him as we live here on this earth, and we wonder, should I submit to the rules of an unbelieving governor? And our Father, here in Romans 13, says to us, submit yourself to every human institution. Again, this is a simple command. It's not easy. We've seen that throughout church history. We've perhaps felt a little taste of it in the last couple of months. But it is a simple, straightforward command. The second one is simple as well. Not only are we to submit to governing authorities, but we are to support governing authorities. Look at verse 6 and 7. For because of this you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. This second simple command is to support the governing authorities, and we see this in a couple of ways, in providing for their livelihood through taxation, and then also rendering to them in totality all that is due them. Verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes. The this here is the ministry of service of government. We saw that back in verse 4. If you remember, government is a minister of God to you for good. Uh, Government bears the sword for our good. And so the this here, for this reason, you also pay taxes. It is that ministry, that God-ordained service of ministry by human government. This is restated in the second half of verse 6. For they themselves are servants of God. They are servants of God. In verse 4, we saw the word deacon was used to describe them. Here, this is a different word. It's the word where we get our English word liturgy. In religious context, it refers to that liturgical service in some sort of a, a worship context. In wider context, this word was used for public officials in secular service. And here, these rulers are God's servants. They serve God. Again, whether they recognize it or not, they have been placed by God to do this very service to humanity. Their 9 to 5 occupation is in service to God. And that service to God is serving others. This is their livelihood. Notice in verse 6, they are devoting themselves to this very thing. That is, they are devoted to God's business, and this is their full-time business. Governments must do this very thing, and, and the people must support government to do these things. Tax revenue supports a God-ordained institution. Government officials are servants of God, devoted to their tasks that government involves. And it is right for civil servants to be paid for their labors. It also means that they are accountable for their labors. They're accountable for their time spent. They're accountable for tax revenue spent. And so when you think about lobbyists and junkets and backroom deals and pork spending and shady contracts, all of those things that go into politics and governance throughout human history, 
will be held accountable to God, because their service ultimately is to Him, which means their accountability ultimately is to Him. Just as the word service uh, implied accountability in verse 4, so again in verse 6, they are accountable for the way they spend people's resources, for the way they've administered God's money. And you know that it costs a lot to do basic government functions. A number of years ago, it was discovered that a toilet seat cover on a C5 Galaxy cost the Defense Department $10,000. And part of that was because the Lockheed Corporation had stopped producing them. <coughs> and so they were hard to come by, and they had to be remanufactured from scratch. Uh, eventually, they found out a way to lower that cost from $10,000 per toilet seat cover to $300. But it costs a lot for governments to operate. There are inefficiencies. There are corruptions. There's favoritism. I personally am a fan of small government. I'm a fan of private enterprise. I believe the private sector has a, a way to get things done more efficiently. I believe in capitalism and competition to help drive down costs. But in the end, there, there's not much that we can do about if inefficiencies when it comes to big bureaucracies and governments. When an organization spends someone else's money, they're less likely to find the best product at the best price for the best purposes. In fact, when government jobs are dependent on revenue, it is always a call to get more revenue to support more government jobs. Governments typically tend to grow rather than shrink. What can you do about all of these inefficiencies? Well, you can vote for lower taxes. You can vote for smaller government. Or if you like higher taxes and bigger government, you can vote for those too. You could run for office. You can write your congressman. You and I can do all of these things in the government system that we are under currently. But you must pay your taxes. You must pay the taxes you owe. You can't change them. Uh, all by yourself, and so you must render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And we do this with gratitude to God. It's God's money anyway, and if God says, pay taxes to governing authorities, then we love him and we obey him. You might be asking, what if my taxes are spent incorrectly? Uh, what if they are spent inefficiently? What if they're spent on things I don't use, and stuff I don't want, and services I don't need? What if my taxes are spent on sin? I mean, if it's really God's money, aren't I responsible to make sure it's not spent on things that God hates? What if my taxes are spent on sinful behavior, sinful priorities, sinful legislation, sinful programs? What about federal funding for abortion or miseducation in public schools? Well, you have to understand that when Paul wrote this, Roman tax revenue was spent on pagan temples, the emperor cult, on slavery, on imperialism, and conquest, and warfare. You and I do not get to decide whether we pay taxes based on how those tax dollars are spent. And Jesus modeled this in a unique way. Now, look at Matthew 17. Matthew 17 tells us the story where Jesus is asked about paying a temple tax. Matthew 17, 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? And Peter said, From strangers. Jesus said to him, And the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Now, this money was spent on things that God was not pleased with. The religious leaders in Jerusalem were corrupt. They lined their own pockets. 
the countrymen who were sellouts to the Roman Empire over Israel were lining their own pockets with tax revenue. In fact, when Jesus and the disciples walked by the temple and the disciples marveled at the beautiful buildings, all Jesus could see was the corruption. All Jesus could see was the misuse of people's funds, the impoverishing of widows and orphans for the sake of ornate buildings and lavish lifestyles for those in leadership. And here Jesus says, we will pay this tax. And he pays Peter's tax and his own tax. And ironically, for a temple tax, the temple representing the sacrificial system to bring reconciliation between God and man through sacrifice to pay for sin. Jesus, of all people, was exempt. He was exempt as a son. He was exempt as as an Israelite to have to pay taxes in that way, but especially as the Son of God and the sinless one to pay taxes going to a sacrificial system to pay for sin. Jesus should have been exempt. And so as not to offend, verse 27, he provided for and paid the tax. And it's interesting, the the Roman taxes were levied on subject states. And so the Jews were required to pay Roman taxes that Roman citizens weren't required to pay. And Jesus says, as you know, in Matthew 22, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And this was a conundrum for the Jews in Jesus' day. Caesar's wicked. He doesn't love the God of the Old Testament. He doesn't love the God of the Bible. Should we be supporting his empire? He's oppressing us. And Jesus says, pay your taxes to Rome. That's what Paul enjoins for us here. Render all what is due to them, verse 7 of Romans 13. Tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom. The taxes here in this verse are those taxes paid by subject nations. And we see those in Luke 10, 22. Roman citizens were exempt from them. But every empire, every country, every nation, every border they crossed, every people they conquered, had to pay these tribute taxes. The next word, custom, custom to whom custom. These were taxes on goods, and everybody had to pay these. These are described in Matthew 10.3. And by giving this summary, taxes to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom, Paul is intending all of the obligations that we have to public servants. And so he goes on, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. When a public official walked by, if there were public salutes you were required to give, if if in England you were required to take off your hat in the presence of the queen, if you were required to carry a certain demeanor in the Oval Office, this is honor we are to give. And Paul intends that all of this is designed by God to give respect for the institution of government that he ordained. And so he says, fear to whom fear. This is respect or profound veneration. This is the same word Peter uses in 1 Peter 2.17 when he says, honor the king. He also says, fear God. Here, Paul says, we give fear to whom fear is due. This respect and veneration. And this whole idea of giving honor to whom honor is due, this is not honor due to them for their personal character qualifications, but honor due to their station as God's servant in the role of government and authority. Listen, dishonorable men have served in human government from time to time. For all of time. But you can't ever say, that's not my president. I didn't vote for him. Look, if God has installed a leader over a nation, he is our leader over our nation. Since there ever was such a thing as human government, there have been dishonorable men in public office. And we honor them not for their intrinsic worthiness to be honored, but because their office represents God's mediated rule on the earth, and we seek to honor him. John Calvin wrote, Therefore, if we are cruelly tormented by a savage prince, if we are greedily despoiled by one who is avaricious and wanton, if we are neglected by a slothful king, if finally we are vexed for piety's sake by one who is impious and sacrilegious, let us first 
Be mindful of our own misdeeds. Do you see where Calvin went there? Think about your own sinfulness first. Which without doubt are chastised by such whips of the Lord. By this, humility will restrain our impatience. Let us then also bring this thought to mind, that it is not for us to remedy such evils, that only this remains, to implore the Lord's help, in whose hand are the hearts of kings and the changing of kingdoms. That is the right perspective. You and I casting ourselves on the safety that obedience to the Lord provides. And we trust Him. Justin Martyr, that third century apologist, one of the church fathers, early his church history Christians, writing to the emperor, he says, Everywhere we, more readily than all men, we endeavor to pay to those appointed by you the taxes, both ordinary and extraordinary, as we have been taught by Jesus. For at that time some came to him to ask him if one ought to pay tribute to Caesar. And he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Thence to God alone we render worship. But in everything else we gladly serve you, acknowledging you as king and ruler of men, and praying that with your kingly power you be found to possess sound judgment. But if you pay no regard to our prayers and frank explanations, we will suffer no loss, since we believe, or rather indeed are persuaded, that every man will suffer punishment in eternal fire on the merit of his deeds, and will render account according to the power that he has received from God, as Christ intimated when he said, To whom God has given more, of him more shall be required. And Justin Martyr was seeking to defend Christians who were being put to death simply on the charge of being Christians. And so he set out to demonstrate to the emperor through a long letter explaining what Christian doctrine is, how Christians actually behave. And one of his appeals was, we are your best citizens. We pay our taxes and we honor you. We won't worship you. And if you don't listen to us and you kill us anyway, just know that you will be held accountable to God in your role as king. It's a great response. I think about David. After David was anointed by Saul to be the next king over Israel, he waited decades to be installed. And in the meantime, Saul was still king. And Saul persecuted David. And David had opportunities to take Saul's life, and he refused. Listen to 1 Samuel 24, 6. So he said to his men, Far be it from me, because of Yahweh, that I should do this thing to my Lord, that is Saul, Yahweh's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is Yahweh's anointed. And in 1 Samuel 24, 10, Behold, this day your eyes have seen that Yahweh has given you Saul today into my hand in a cave, and some people told me to kill you, but my eye had pity on you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord. For he is Yahweh's anointed. And then in 1 Samuel 26, 9, David said to Abishai, Do not destroy Saul, for who can stretch out his hand against Yahweh's anointed and be without guilt? In 1 Samuel 26, 23, Yahweh will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For Yahweh delivered you into my hand today, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against Yahweh's anointed. And then finally, in 2 Samuel 1, when the Amalekite told David that he had killed Saul, David said to him, How is it that you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy Yahweh's anointed? Really, is a remarkable scene. An unworthy man in the office of king, behaving unbecomingly, unfaithful to his Lord, and persecuting the one who had been his best and most loyal citizen. And yet David still said, I will not stretch out my hand because he is Yahweh's anointed. David understood the theology of kingship. That every human ruler has behind him God's ordaining. Human government is God's institution. Think about what it must be like for a citizen of this world to agonize over bad government. That is an endless and hopeless exercise. Sure, one bad government by, might be replaced by one a little less bad. 
But bad government will always exist on the earth while mere men are in charge. But consider what it is to be a citizen of heaven who longs for good government. Look, our longing is not located on November 2nd. It's not located in the next special election. It's never located in a complete government overhaul. Our hope is not grounded in a draining of the swamp or some revolution. Our longing for good government has a guaranteed fulfillment. And it is not a kingdom of this world. As we look forward to the future and think about what it means to live out the principles that we've seen the last four weeks in Romans 13, I want to give us some heart preparation verses, some verses to tuck away, to to remember, uh, to run back to, to think rightly about God's sovereignty back of human government so that we're not tempted to respond improperly, irrationally. Of course, you remember Romans 8.28, God causes governments to work together for good to those who love God, right? God causes all things, and governments are included. In Genesis 50.20, Joseph said to his brothers, You meant evil against me, but God intended it for good. That same principle is true of faulty human governments. Tuck away in your heart Revelation 20. Go back and read it again in that time when Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem, when Satan himself will be bound in chains. He will be released at the end of that thousand years for a final rebellion that Jesus will put down. But for a thousand years, he will not be allowed to be out roaming the earth like a lion seeking whom he may devour, deceiving the nations. Jesus will rule on the earth. Tuck that away in your heart. Let that be an anchor for your hope. Good government is coming. That good government is described throughout the Old Testament. I'll give you a few examples. You can uh, tuck these away as well. Isaiah 2 and verse 2. It will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Verse 4 of Isaiah 2. He will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. That day hasn't happened yet. It's coming. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish it. Listen to Isaiah 11, 4 to 10. With righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he'll slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little boy will lead them. And the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. The weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. And they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. These promises of Jesus' government on the earth have not yet been fulfilled. These are the things we long for. Listen to what God says about the nations, Isaiah 66, 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all the nations and the tongues, and they will come and see my glory. Tuck away in your heart Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 and Psalm 110. Listen to Zechariah 14, 9 and 10. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day Yahweh will be the only one and his name the only one. All the land will be changed into a plain. 
from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate, as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. The New Testament echoes these same promises. Luke 1, 32 and 33 he will be great, speaking of Jesus, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. He did not do those things in his first coming, but Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he will keep his promises. In the meantime, Christian, you and I tuck away these verses from Hebrews 10, 32 to 35. Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners, you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you had for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, Christian. Do not throw away your confidence. It has great reward. We're not alone in this. We've looked at some examples from church history. We'll close with just a couple more. John Calvin said, However these deeds of men are judged in themselves, speaking of government, still the Lord accomplishes His work through them. When He breaks the, the scepters of arrogant kings when he overturns intolerable governments? Let princes hear this and be afraid. But we must, in the meantime, be very careful not to despise or violate that authority of magistrates, full of venerable majesty, which God has established by the weightiest decrees. Even though it may reside with the most unworthy men who defile it as much as they can with their own wickedness, for if the correction of unbridled despotism is the Lord's to avenge, let us not at once think that, that it is entrusted to us, to whom no command has been given, except to obey and to suffer. Striking words from John Calvin, who got run out of France under persecution, and who spent his life training men to go back into France, many of whom died, were martyred under persecution by government. John Calvin was not speaking theoretically. He knew personally what was at stake in this. And yet his heart was held captive by the word of God. We are to honor kings. And if the most unworthy people hold that office, it is not the individual citizen's position to undo that, but simply to obey and suffer. John Calvin goes on in the very next paragraph of the Institutes, to describe that while private individuals are prohibited from taking governmental change into their own hands, persons in government do have the responsibility to uphold what is right. They're held accountable to God for that. And so Calvin gives a category where government officials might go against each other, not bearing the sword in vain as they seek to do what is right amidst government. In the first century, a letter was written called First Clement. And I want to read to you from First Clement. He was one who also suffered under, or wrote about Christians suffering under, persecution from government authorities. And he includes this prayer to the Lord regarding government authorities. He says, Yes, Lord, make your face to shine upon us in peace for our good, that we may be sheltered by your mighty hand, and delivered from every sin by your uplifted arm. And deliver us from them that hate us wrongfully. Give concord and peace to us, and to all that dwell on the earth, as you gave to our fathers when they called on you in faith and truth and holiness. While we render obedience to your almighty and most excellent name, and to our rulers and governors upon the earth. Thou, Lord and Master, has given them the power and sovereignty through your excellent and unspeakable might, that we, knowing the glory and honor which you have given them, may submit ourselves unto them in nothing resisting your will. Grant unto them, therefore, O Lord, health, peace, concord, stability, that they might administer the government which you have given them without failure. For you, O heavenly Master, King of the ages, 
you give to the sons of men glory and honor and power over all things that are upon the earth. Do you, Lord, direct their counsel according to that which is good and well-pleasing in your sight, that administering in peace and gentleness with godliness the power which you have given them, they may obtain your favor. And the author of the letter, uh, First Clement, is doing exactly what Paul told Christians to do, to pray for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we might live a godly life. There's a second century letter called the Epistle to Diognetus, and the writer is unknown, the recipient is unknown. There are some guesses as to who this was written to, maybe somebody in the emperor's court. And he's describing Christians, again a defense to the governing authorities about the innocence of Christians under that persecution. Please stop persecuting us. Let me describe for you what Christians are like. And he says this, Christians dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all the things with others, and yet they are into all these things as foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They have children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time they surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men, and they are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and are restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, and yet they abound in all. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor they are glorified. They are evil spoken of, and yet are justified. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners. They are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. Friends, let it be said of us. Let's pray. God, we ask for your help to obey these simple commands. And knowing my own heart, these things are hard. It's hard at times to pay taxes, knowing what dollars go towards. It's difficult at times to render submission to governing authorities that are so flawed, sometimes incompetent, uh, and often ungodly. And yet, we render this obedience to them because you have asked it of us. We want our reputation before a watching world to match our profession of faith and our loyalties and our citizenship. And we certainly want you to be honored in the way we are in subjection to earthly authorities. God, would you help us in this? Would you give your church a reputation for unity around these truths that we with one voice might proclaim to a lost world a transcendent citizenship and a hope that goes way beyond the next election? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.